Support for Louisiana, the state we're in, is provided by... Every day, I go to work for Entergy. I know customers are counting on me. So Entergy is investing millions of dollars to keep the lights on and installing new technology to prevent outages before they happen. Together. 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 We power life. Additional support provided by the Fred B. and Ruth B. Ziegler Foundation and the Ziegler Art Museum located in Jennings City Hall. The museum focuses on emerging Louisiana artists and is an historical and cultural center for Southwest Louisiana. And the Foundation for Excellence in Louisiana Public Broadcasting with support from viewers like you. TEDx gives these ideas a platform, so to show an even much larger audience the cool things that are happening here. An injection of homegrown ideas. We work with you know, all the different businesses there because it's not just that company. You have to sort of give people the tools so that they can sustain this at home. Meeting health needs of workers. Concrete doesn't drink water, so it's like there's, you have more ways in which flooding becomes like, impactful. Putting city drainage in the hands of the people. Hi everyone, I'm Kara St. Cyr. And I'm Andre Moro. Tonight we begin with hopeful news. It's hard to view the Gulf South as a model for education improvement strategies, but that's what's happening. Yeah, Louisiana, Alabama, and Mississippi are seeing reading scores slowly improve following a national decline in literacy rates. Both Alabama and Louisiana saw some gains in fourth grade reading. But Mississippi went from ranking 49th for reading in 2013 to 21st in 2022. Very impressive. And now we'll look at some other headlines making news around our state. U.S. Congressman Garrett Graves is one of a select group of negotiators chosen by the President and House Speaker to help close a deal to keep the U.S. government solvent. There's a June 1st deadline to help work out a deal to increase the nation's ability to borrow. If a deal is not reached by June 1st, that's when the Treasury Department says the government could begin defaulting on its debt for the first time in history. A new study shows oil production in the Gulf of Mexico is 43% cleaner than the global average, outperforming other nations like Russia, China, Brazil, Iran, Iraq, and Nigeria. Senator Bill Cassidy says it's clear that the U.S., especially Louisiana and the Gulf of Mexico, produces cleaner energy than anywhere thanks to our investment in our companies and workers. In the southwest Louisiana town of Elton, there's a recall effort underway from a group seeking to remove first-term mayor Keisha Skinner Lemoyne. It comes as allegations swirl about election irregularities and fraud. Organizers filed paperwork this week with the Secretary of State's office. A KPLC TV investigation found questionable voting credentials among nearly three dozen people, enough votes to impact election results. And some good news, a new festival is coming to New Orleans. It's called Pickleball Fest, and it was created by former Saints quarterback Drew Brees. The festival will have 24 tournament pickle roll courts, live music, and a chance to watch Brees play. Some of the proceeds will go to the Brees Dream Foundation. The event will take place August 10th through the 13th at the Ernest Moriel Convention Center. The Louisiana company that invented a machine to process shrimp back in 1947 is leading the way in employee wellness and health care. Latrum is headquartered in Harahan in Metro New Orleans and has offices around the globe. I talked with Dr. Tro Collagen of Dr. Tro's Weight Loss about what Latrum provides its employees. Tell me first about how you came on board with Latrum's wellness plan and how it's worked. So first of all, I have to uh, give a big uh, shout out to Latrum. I have worked with several companies. So I was an addition to their already established wellness program. They had dietitians, personal trainers, physical therapists, health clinics, and they came to me and they said, we want more. We have patients with diabetes. 
we have patients with obesity, they're suffering, and we want to help them. And they said, we want to bring your services to the entire company. And so uh, that was exciting to me uh, because I know in the literature, it's been published that a metabolic health program focused on nutrition, focused on you know, low-carb eating, intermittent fasting, it's been shown to save companies money. It's been shown to reduce uh, the costs for medications. And patients absolutely love it because they lose weight and they come off their diabetes medications. So well, I was here. excited. That's what's happened here. You've, you've seen patients average an amazing amount of weight loss. Um, and the entire company is healthier, happier, uh, and, and the company itself seems to be fantastic to its employees. Yeah, so you know that that's that was the ideal partnership. Somebody who's actually invested in the health of their employees. So we started with two years ago. We started talking about this, and we started a pilot program with about fifteen patients. And we've published on the results of those fifteen patients. But now the program's expanded to the entire company, including their family members uh, of employees. And so we have roughly two hundred, you know, uh, employees that are you know, our patients here in our clinic, and uh, the results have been spectacular. The average person at six months loses roughly 34 pounds. At one year, the average person loses 52 pounds, and uh, they're lowering their blood pressure 17 points. Their A1C, which is a marker of diabetes, is coming down 1%, which is stronger than some medications out there on the market. And this is while they stopped medications. So the average participant stopped two different medications that they did not need anymore. Uh, we've had patients come off of insulin. We've had patients come off of Ozempic. We've had patients come off of blood pressure meds they did not meet, need anymore. So the patients are happy because they are losing weight. Uh, their employer is happy because they're happier, healthier, and don't need as many medications. And we're happy because our team is focused on ending diabetes, obesity, hypertension, and metabolic syndrome. So it's a win, 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 which is great. Most of what people have heard in uh, nutritional management from their dietitians and nutritionists and doctors historically has been things that haven't worked out. Count your calories, eat less, move more. You know, we've been saying these for 50 years. And so when all of a sudden a doctor comes on board, says, hey, look, we're going to check your labs. We're going to check your blood sugar in real time. We're reviewing their labs at three months, six months, and 12 months. If, they're, if they don't see progress, they're, you know, I'm accountable. And focusing on metabolic health has been absolutely amazing for patients. When you teach them what processed carbs and sugar can do to their health, the ill effects, uh, and when they see, for example, on a blood sugar meter in real time, when they're eating something uh, that they thought was healthy, but their blood sugar is going up 200, 200 to 250, they realize, hey, wait a second, it's time to change. And that information is in an instant. We have a low-carb almond flour-based king cake made right, right in Metairie. Uh, we have a low-carb pizza right, made right there. We work with you know, all the different businesses there because it's not just that company. You have, to, you have to sort of give people the tools so that they can sustain this at home. And uh, it's been an absolute awesome pleasure. It's been, we've learned so much about uh, Louisiana cuisine, and we're just, we're just excited. This is our mission. Great. Dr. Tro, it's so great to talk to you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. What if community members controlled policy around drainage systems? The Water Collaborative in New Orleans is aiming to make that a reality. The organization is starting the Water Justice Fund in an effort to improve drainage systems and increase green space in the Crescent City. I spoke with one of the organizers and here's what he had to say. So can you tell me a little bit about democratizing drainage? What does that mean? Yeah, uh, we decided to attach democratized drainage to the Water Justice Fund because when we think about something in New Orleans that affects all of us, it's water, right? In whatever way, whether that's coming up or coming down, um, democratizing that means putting the power or putting the responsibility back in the people's hands who it affects the most. Um, and over and over the conversations about like water trauma and dealing with water and problems that need to be fixed that just never get fixed, um, we decided something had to be done to like unite our community on this issue. Well, you mentioned water trauma. I've never heard it referred to like that before. Can you tell me what that means? Yeah, I mean, 
water trauma in New Orleans, we think of things that are so big like Katrina and you like have family members and com like, community leaders like just now we were talking about how they won't even go to like the movie theater because they're in the dark for too long and they can't tell if it like if it's going to rain, I need to see when it rains. I don't leave the house because of all of these things. So the trauma of I lost so much, I could lose again. I could be affected by this. I could get stuck. And so these just like stories you hear over and over about like how water has negatively impacted people's lives because it's powerful. Right. And so all the way from those big events like Katrina, all the way down to as small as like I can't put the trash out because I don't want it to roll away in the flash flooding that's happening tonight. So it's the question and the, the basically like a deep breath that has nowhere to go for a lot of people. They have a deep breath to prepare for something, but they never know when it's actually going to happen. And so there's living with this resilience inside of them um, that it has to be really exhausting. Yeah, to never know whenever it's going to rain or never know whenever the rain event can turn into a storm event or yeah. a flash flood event or whatever else comes with that. Yeah. So whenever you mention democratizing, I mean, we talked about this word and that means basically putting the power to the people. Why do you think that it's necessary to give them that power? I mean, we've seen what happens when we don't. Like for the longest time, the, the structure of water and politics and management in New Orleans has gotten so far removed from the like chaotic criminal state that it was in the beginning, right? The people who started New Orleans were sent here because they like, you know, degenerates from France or indigenous people and then black people were forced here. And they're the reason that it survived. They're the reason that industrialism and things like that came. But there's so much like respect for the land and green spaces and parks and all of these things that felt like the people had the power. And then slowly over the years you see all of the ways in which more people in power have taken more and more from the communities and left it vulnerable to the like the elements. To the, yeah, yeah, to the elements. So like even outside of our office here, uh, the Claiborne Overpass is that was like a black hustling and bustling like shopping center and it went right through the middle, took out parks, historic houses, all that. And what you're left with is a key island effect. You're left with more pavement, which concrete doesn't drink water. So it's like there's, you have more ways in which flooding becomes like impactful. And so if we ask like why we need to democratize drainage is because the people in power and politics as usual is so detrimental, not only to the people that it serves, but now it's coming into like, it's going to clash with the elements. It's going to clash with New Orleans being underwater if we don't address this. So what type of policy are you hoping to implement alongside the people? Yeah, I mean, so it's the way that it's built, it's kind of like it is a community led policy. So we're flipping it on its head and we're doing it from the ground up. We're doing it from the community up. And that's one thing like, I'll never do is be an expert on somebody else's community. And that's why this is so um, stress relieving in a sense because it's a it's, it's a big topic but it's stress relieving because i can't fix it all and so we want this to be a policy that is interactive and dynamic and always growing um, and changing to what we think as new orleanians is best and so inviting all those voices this policy would be one that is equitable it is one that would be transparent we would know what the money is going to it would be one that is created specifically for drainage so even if it turns out that we want to create a office of drainage, then that would look like that's where the money goes, the way that the structure is built. We just start using the things that are good for New Orleans, like its people, the way that they're supposed to. And so making it a policy that's built upon need um, and the hope of New Orleans, rather than the commodification of the things that make this place good. So Water Justice New Orleans is the name of the entire project. Yes. How can people support it? How can they find out more? Yeah, um, if you go to waterjusticeneworleans.org, um, there's a chance to sign up for maybe a couple of the last workshops um, to kind of be a part of that building process. This project is born out of um, a lot of hope for our city, um, I think, and I'm happy to be a part of that. And it's also built on um, just this idea that like we're so used to being resilient. Um, but maybe we're tired of being resilient as we well. We don't have to be strong all the time. Yeah, <laughs> we want to. We want to like remind the city that like we're a resilient city, but it doesn't mean that we keep having to be. We don't have to be strong all the time. If you want to support the Water Justice Fund, you can head to the Water Collaborative website. That is nolawater.org.
TEDx Baton Rouge is coming this September to the capital city, the capital region, and two of the organizers of the event are here to discuss it with me right now, Morgan Almeida and also Melissa Thompson and Tell us what the event hopes to achieve. Sure. So TEDx Baton Rouge is a is a licensed event um, through the TED um, platform, which a lot of people are familiar with. So this event is independently organized by the two of us and a team of volunteers. And we are hoping to bring this event to fruition to spur ideas worth spreading. Yes. And to talk about all of the great homegrown ideas and people that are doing really cool things in our own backyard in South Louisiana. This would be to propel Baton Rouge into the future and uh, quickly, right? Yeah, absolutely. So we want our local residents to learn more about their own community and great ideas that are happening here already that they might not know about. But then also TEDx gives these ideas a platform to be on the national stage too. Right. So to show an even much larger audience the cool things that are happening here. So ideas, dreams, brain power, and all coming from the local community. Yes. Absolutely, and a lot of the stories that we're hoping to give a platform to are untold stories in Baton Rouge. These are people and ideas that might not typically get the large platform or have a large following on social media. So by having this event, not only the live event in our community, but also the YouTube videos that will be posted later, it's giving uh, a spotlight to our community and those really fantastic ideas. Is there an example of something like that that you can think of? Sure. You we're, can share? Yeah, we're not ready to share the speakers. We'll actually uh, debut the no speaker. speaker. List right, in right. July, but do you want to share? Yeah, maybe an absolutely. Idea? So, TED actually stands for Technology, Entertainment, and Design. And so that's the crux of what we look for, but then it expands past that too. So, we're looking at science topics, we're looking at health topics. Mm -hmm. We want to get very research, data backed ideas to share with the community. All right, and that's something that uh, any community would want to be having great things happening in that right. realm with, right? Yeah, especially with the universities that we have in town. There's so much research that's being done with Pennington. Um, there's people that are entrepreneurs and have really fantastic ideas. It's already happening here. Yes. We just want right. to provide a platform for those ideas to be spread. What are some of the things that um, might come from this, for example? It would be like the, the building of an attraction or something to uh, draw a spotlight to the downtown area? Maybe, yeah, I, I, you, you don't know, and each year is completely different. Like, that's so, what's exciting about it. Right, yeah. we were both a part of TEDx um, LSU, which was the first TEDx event in town. We now have three total, but TEDx LSU, um, there were times where speakers would talk about a really fantastic idea that they had, maybe for a nonprofit, and there happened to be somebody in the audience that agreed with them that that was a great idea, and funded them on the spot to oh, create wow. that wow. to create that organization and and have really some good community awareness, but also community involvement. Right. Mm -hmm. So we've all seen what a, a TEDx talk looks like. Mm -hmm. A TED talk looks like. This will take place where and the date. All right. So it is going to be in downtown Baton Rouge at Manship Theater okay. on September 14th. Right. It is a night event, so we're going to get that energy flowing after our work day and yes. hopefully get the conversations going. And from the speakers on the stage, will they be talking directly with the audience at that time? Yes. Yeah, so it's it's kind of like a stage performance right, in that right. it's a highly produced event. So if you're there and you're a part of it, um, you get to be a part of the live audience. But right. then they also are going to be recorded and put on YouTube later for of course. public consumption right. for anybody in the world to right them. and that's where a lot of the feedback really comes because mm -hmm. people are drawn to YouTube they see these and if something clicks then there's great excitement about it I know that uh, John Spain from Baton Rouge Area Foundation is forever looking for attractions sure. and things and is working on several things right now that we've discussed and yeah. so uh, some of that could be um, maybe a byproduct of this or some of those things could sure. be discussed yeah. In the Absolutely. TED talk. Um, you guys worked on the LSU event, you said. Mm -hmm. What was the, the point of that one, the main purpose of that one? Yeah, so I think the purpose is similar but different. So it's similar in that the concept is ideas we're spreading and to have a platform where a community can gather and talk about good ideas that are bubbling up from your own backyard. But um, that event, because it was on LSU's campus, it had an LSU lens, right? So many of the speakers were uh, LSU professors. Sure. Most of the volunteers were LSU staff and mm -hmm. students. 
students. And so it happened within that community. Um, but we did our best to also highlight yes. other great things that were happening in Baton Rouge. With this, this one is Capital Region. This is Capital right? Region. So yes, we um, we both care so much about this mm -hmm. community. We chose to live here and we've chose to you know, plant our roots here and be a part of this. And we want to be here for the long haul. Yes, And so this exactly. is our way to give back to Baton Rouge and to spur that dialogue. Well, it is tremendous. It's one of the, the big things that is constantly sort of a thorn when people say, well, the brain power is leaving. People go to mm -hmm. school here. They leave to go to Houston, Orlando, or right. Austin. We're, we're staying. <laughs> I was going to say. You stay here. Exactly. <laughs> we have our we own you. personal motives of talent retention Very for good. the region, too. So We're excited about it. We'll put a graphic up and... Um, can't wait to see it. Thank Thanks you. so much Thank for being you. here. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks Thank you. it. The Bridge Builders Collective offers an intimate look at trailblazing leaders across the United States, including New Orleans, as they work to build better futures for their communities. Yeah, LPB, along with Indie Lens Pop-Up, hosted a screening of five short films that explore the important work of five individuals and organizations that bridge critical gaps in their community as they relate to legal system reform. That's right. We have a clip of one of those films. Take a look. Where harshness rules. You show compassion, man. You sit out like a sore thumb. It's like a, a rose growing out of concrete. The day I step out the prison, I, I decided that we just can't let it go on and go on. Somebody got to stand and break the cycle. I'm on Esplanade and Dauphine. I'm come back around and come up on Esplanade. If you're in a hole and you're looking out for help, a guy may pass by with a rope and drop a rope down. But if the rope's not long enough, it's not reaching you. I don't know what's going on with you. Okay. So it, it came out to be something bad turned into something positive. Mm -hmm. And if they can't own up to their mistakes and be changed for the better so y'all both can grow, you got to grow. You got to grow. Okay. The Faith Planet is a place that provides transitional health care for people recently coming out of prison. They're trying to get back into society. First thing we want to do is find out what type of health care do they need. Coming out of prison, most guys are not trusting of, of doctors. Now you're not seen as, as a human being, you're a number. If they didn't like you, you may you never get seen by a doctor. Show me good thing, man. Then you gotta dig in you. I try to reach back for as many as I can reach. I got big arms. To watch all the films and learn more about the Bridge Builders Collective and hear the conversation hosted by LPB, please visit lpb.org slash bridgebuilders. Also this week, a new episode of our digital series Ritual is available. The show's host and New Orleans singer Tank Ball explores the origins of the Southern spiritual practice of hoodoo, tracing its lineage back to the era of slavery. Let's take a look. For most of us, Mentioning a conversation you just had with a deceased family member would be guaranteed to raise some concerns. But in West Africa, talking to the dead is nothing unusual. Known as ancestor worship, the practice is woven into the fabric of daily life. But when the transatlantic slave trade whipped people away from their families and way of life, it placed their ancestral chain in terrible danger. To protect it, they turned to religions like hoodoo, which restored their access to the spirits despite being so far away from home. Today, I'm going to find out how Africans held on to these ties to the ancestors against all odds and how descendants use memories of the past to bring about healing in the present. I'm Tariana Tang Ball, and this is Ritual. For Africans on the plantation, maintaining the religion of their birth in the Americas simply was not the option it was for the Puritans of Plymouth Rock. Most spiritual practices among enslaved people were feared and forbidden by plantation owners who looked to eradicate any sign of strength. So in secrecy, often under the cover of night, enslaved Africans used different spiritual tools from home that they adapted in order to survive an otherwise impossible situation. 
The religions they created had much in common, like spirit communication, which was practiced by all of them. But they were also unique to the places where they were created. Voodoo they called it in Haiti, Candouble in Brazil, and Santeria in Cuba. In North America, it was known as hoodoo. Hoodoo doctors gathered medicinal plants to make the traditional remedies that secured a community's physical survival, while other rituals attended their spiritual wounds and reminded them of a time before slavery. To understand this fascinating tradition, I've come to Dr. Camila Martin, a scholar who specializes in the history of black spiritual practices in North America. Dr. Camila, I am so excited to be here with you today. You are a brilliant scholar. And if I may, I would love to ask you, what is ancestor worship? So simply put, ancestor worship is the reverence and celebration of our literal ancestors, those who came before us in our family lineage. More broadly, it's a part of a collection of spiritual and healing traditions um, that have come to the United States by way of the transatlantic slave trade. So ancestor worship is part of a larger collection of spiritual traditions of the United States, popularly known as, as conjure or hoodoo. We want to be sure to keep the memory of our ancestors alive. You can watch all the ritual episodes you missed on PBS Voices YouTube channel or by searching PBS Ritual on YouTube. Next week will be my last, at least presenting weekly news here at LPB. I'm retiring after 39 years after next Friday's broadcast of SWI, Louisiana, the state we're in. And I'm definitely emotional about this. It's been a privilege to learn from you, Andre, and it's been a big year for Andre. He won the Louisiana Association of Broadcasters Lifetime Achievement Award for 2023. And yeah, yeah, really appreciative of that. It's been so much fun to learn from you and the opportunity to work with you. I don't know. I've been watching you for a really long time. That was one of the reasons why I took this job was to work well, alongside you, so you'll you. definitely be missed. We've got one more week, though. Next one more week, week so don't that's cry right. yet. <laughs> Everyone, that's our show for this week. Remember, you can watch anything LPB anytime wherever you are with our LPB PBS app. You can catch LPB news and public affairs shows as well as other Louisiana programs you've come to enjoy over the years. And please like us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. For everyone in Louisiana Public Broadcasting, I'm Andre Morrow. And I'm Kara St. Cyr. Until next time, that's the state we're in. Every day, I go to work for Entergy. I know customers are counting on me. So Entergy is investing millions of dollars to keep the lights on and installing new technology to prevent outages before they happen. Together. 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 We power life. Additional support provided by the Fred B. and Ruth B. Ziegler Foundation and the Ziegler Art Museum located in Jennings City Hall. The museum focuses on emerging Louisiana artists and is an historical and cultural center for Southwest Louisiana. And the Foundation for Excellence in Louisiana Public Broadcasting with support from viewers like you.